Hi, Rishi here. As Prime Minister, I'm focused on delivering on your priorities. So I'll be on the road to join GB News for a special People's Forum on Monday the 12th of February, where I'll be taking questions from a live audience about the issues that really matter to you. The economy, immigration, the NHS. See you there. We've been asking who is your rock, because Camilla is clearly being the king's rock mm. at the moment. Dave in Luton, morning Dave, says, my rock is my wife of 47 years. She has been by my side and seen me through prostate cancer, a benign brain tumour and a heart attack. I am so lucky to still be here, and I put that down to having a beautiful, caring wife. That's lovely. Isn't that lovely? Interesting one, though, I, and I get it. Some people will go, what are you talking about, uh, from Archie? But I get it, Archie. Is my rock is my 19-year-old cat. Oh yeah, no, I Cats get that. Cats can be such a companion. Yeah, oh, I totally get that. Gary says my rock is my mother. I'm 59 and she's 88. Mm. Now, when you get when you get in touch and tell us who your rock is, let's have the rock's name. Yes. That's three people who haven't actually said the name. Oh, loads. Because yeah. Avi in Norwich says my rock is my darling husband. We've been together 57 years. Oh, oh good. good. He's good. kind, gentle and loving. Through good times and bad, together and apart for work. Apart for work, that is. Yeah. That's, you know, it's lovely. Nice. Keep them coming through, gbviews at gbnews.com. Uh, let's have a look at the newspapers for you this morning, should we? Start with the Sunday Telegraph. Has the British Army's desire to relax security checks from overseas to boost diversity and inclusion? Really? Uh, well, the Independent says criminals are using courts to escape justice by pleading not guilty to exploit trial delays. The Sunday Mirror has the King's heartfelt thanks to the country for our support to him during his cancer diagnosis. And the Tories have given up the fight. That's on the front of the Observer. The Sunday Express uh, is looking at the King as well and his gratitude for the nation's support. Well, joining us to go through what's making the news is Deputy Editor of Spite, Fraser Myers, and writer and commentator Candice Holdsworth. Thank you very much for getting up so early and coming in. Good morning. Um, so, Candice, we're starting with the King. Yes. So this is front page of The Express, and it's the story of King Charles basically saying thank you to everyone for all the support he's received and saying how much he now really can empathise with people who've been through cancer treatment, which... Yeah. Once, I think only, in, only when you receive that diagnosis or if you have someone close to you who, who has received that diagnosis will you truly know that landscape. And it's something you can't know until that moment. Mm. And so I can imagine that, you know, it has just expanded his consciousness in that way that he's never experienced before. You understand your fragility, but you're also, you have to place all your trust in the medical professionals mm. looking after you, and they're sort of, they're your guide. Would you agree, Anne, on Absolutely, that Absolutely, yeah, completely. And you do have to, you have to make up your mind who you're going to trust. Yes. I think, because you don't know about cancer and how it works and all the rest of it. You have to, I, I reckon, this is what I said to my family, is that I'm, uh, I've found the surgeon I believe in and I'm going to do what he tells me to do. Mm. Mm. And that's basically the way... Uh, the way I had it. But there we see the king and Camilla by his side, and she is his rock. And isn't he lucky to have her? You need it. I mean, it's why, you, that, it's, why it's in the wedding vows, in sickness mm. and in health. Yes. It, I mean, there are points that will place so much pressure on a relationship. And sometimes it's underestimated how much strain the partner takes as mm. well. Yeah. And sometimes they don't feel like they have a right to feel like they should be stressed, that mm. it's the other person is the one who all their focus should be on, but they're also worrying and they're also oh, yeah. taking strain. I'm trying to worry for two. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Um, Fraser, let's have a look at the Sunday Telegraph, should we? Um, which is claiming the army is easing security checks. Yeah, so this is, is it's slightly it's a worrying. pretty extraordinary story where um, often diversity is talked about as, you know, trying to make institutions more representative of the country. But this diversity drive is leading the army to actually recruit people from overseas and to reduce the security checks on them, to reduce some of the requirements. So, for instance, like saying they don't have to have lived in the country for as long um, as uh, uh, under the current rules. Which is pretty extraordinary. I mean, the armed forces, you need people to be loyal. You need people who are trustworthy if they're going to be uh, given security clearances. This is not a thing that can be compromised on, surely. And I think what this shows is that 
diversity and inclusion has almost taken on a kind of religious quality um, in the establishment, where even something where life is at risk, it seems diversity comes first. And it's not just uh, that security checks are being eased, there's also, uh, in the insides of the Telegraph, there's also lots of stories about uh, the kind of trainings that uh, army officers are expected to go to. They have to do unconscious bias training, something which was actually banned by the government uh, for civil servants because it doesn't work and actually increases racial animosity rather than decreases it. Uh, there's training on pronouns, there's training on using inclusive language, not using male and female terms for um, you know, various military roles like riflemen. Uh, so it seems that the army, which is, you know, a sort of institution that you would expect to be fairly hard-nosed, <laughs> uh, is completely... Uh, it's going it, woke. It's, it's going woke. I mean, it's actually drowning in wokeness, it seems. I, That's yeah. a worry. I don't like the sound of that. I want the army to be an efficient fighting force. Mm. Yeah, and, and what's mm. fascinating is that the defenders of this keep saying that actually diversity and inclusion and all these things are necessary for operational inefficiency. I don't see how it is. It seems like a distraction, if anything. It seems like it undermines their operations. And we need to understand why they're struggling to recruit people. What is going mm. on? I mean, are all these drives that they've done in the past, these marketing, advertising drives, are they actually not getting the message out? Are they not appealing to the people who normally would be drawn to going to the army? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't quite understand this um, in the sense that they're not wanting to recruit as many people, mm. are they? I mean, now we've got more people leaving than joining at the moment, but the numbers are way down because actually the, the, the checks have been cut in half. So they actually, we, it's about funding. Fund it, fund it better and then do a proper recruitment drive. Yes, and, yes. And double the numbers or whatever it is. I, mean, I, I can also see that diversity training is important. I mean, I, I, we, we expect the army to also be a civilised place in which to work. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, gay people, uh, people of different uh, ethnic origins and all the rest of it should be treated properly with, with um, yes, respect. But but yes, but there's also got to be the... There's also a lot of banter mm, in yeah. the army. It's why all that hoo-ha, if you remember back to Harry uh, years ago and what he was accused, he had to make apologise for all of the, the way he described someone. Anyone who's been in the army knows that's banter and they all take the lash out of each yes, other yeah, all yeah. the time. Everyone, whether you're black, white, gay, straight, ginger, female, mm. whatever it might be, yeah. you're going to get the mickey taken yeah. out of you. And that's part of the building of it all. Absolutely. I mean, that's actually how people bond. You yeah. know? Uh, people don't bond by following, um, you know, a script written by an HR manager. They bond, you know, it's, especially if you're talking about it in the context of the army, where people are going to be fighting together. You've mm. got to... You know that you've got a person's back. Um, yeah, you're going to have a different kind of relationship than you would uh, with someone, you know, at a desk in an office. Yes. Yeah, literally brothers in arms. Yeah. Well, yes, and also, I mean, those are values which actually appeal to a lot of people. Camaraderie, mm. bravery, service. I mean, if you focus on those core traditional values, maybe you'll attract more people. Even, you know, technology and intelligence and problem solving, so many people would be drawn to that. Yeah. Yeah, mm. I, I don't. I find this very worrying. Never mind unconscious bias training. I said, I said before, I was made to do that once. Oh God! And it was the most ridiculous thing I've ever done in all my life. Mm. And I'm, I'm all for you know being open and lovely and nice with people. <laughs> the unconscious bias thing, bias thing is ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, it's been shown time and time again not to work. Um, and so it's amazing that it sort of still carries on in, in zombie form. And, and again, the government has given explicit instructions to civil servants, do not do this training. It is bad. Mm. It doesn't help the, the problem it's supposed to solve. And yet there's just this... As I said, I think there is almost a religious commitment to some of these ideas, you know, and, and you can defeat uh, wokeism in one department and it crops up somewhere mm. else. Yeah. And it, it's, it's almost unstoppable. Yes. Um, all right, let's, can we have a look at um, Starmer's green job plan? This is in the Sunday Mirror, Candice, because obviously the, the, the green growth plan's gone for a burden now, so we now we've got a green jobs plan instead. Yeah, so this was a story in the Mail, and... Oh, yes, Mail, is it? Sorry. I'm sorry, the Mirror, you're right, sorry, my mistake, it's in the Mirror. So, Keir Starmer has um, unveiled, supposedly, these bold plans for a, a green employment revolution, and he's pledged to create work for half a million more people, and he said that it will create jobs where you live, but it's so vague. He doesn't really say what these jobs no. are. Kirstama <laughs> being vague. <laughs> yeah. Shock horror. Yeah. 
Um, and this is after they've downgraded their green investment plan from about mm. 28 billion to 15 billion. And this is just so common of Labour. You know, they, they have all these plans. They say they're going to invest all this money. You have no idea if it's actually going to be executed well, what it's going to look like. And I, for one, and I think a lot of people, are just feeling really sceptical. You know, it's sort of future-faking. But, it, but it's, going, it's going to create jobs where you live. And what does that <laughs> mean? Like, what will they be? Will they be good quality jobs? Or will they be jobs people want to do? I mean, it just doesn't say anything to me. And I'm just tired of politicians constantly promising promising, 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 instead of just allowing market forces or individuals to do what they do best. Well, maybe we'll hear more details quite soon, because um, lots of commentators, political commentators, are beginning to talk about a May election, oh. aren't they, again? What May did I say? What did I you say? You did say May, yeah, you always have. Yeah. And apparently, more and more of the political commentators are saying, we probably could get an election in May which must mean that uh, Keir Starmer's got to actually start being specific. He will have to say something. But, I mean, with the, the green jobs, I mean, we've heard this so many times. We've been hearing this, actually, since way back uh, in the day of Gordon Brown. We were promised a green industrial revolution. Right. And, and Cameron did and as well. Cameron when promised a similar promised thing. Um, it never really materialises. And, and it's interesting, again, with... Um, Whenever Keir Starmer talks about green policies, it, it seems as if it solves every single problem in one. You know, not only is it going to cure climate change, but also going to give us great jobs, cut our energy bills, uh, reduce our dependence on Russia. I mean, none of these things are really, um, you know, are, are necessarily going to be an outcome of more wind farms. But they seem to think that anything, if it's got the word green on it, then it's just a miracle cure for yeah. all the country's mm -hmm. ills. And, yeah. and now, you know, it's going to bring jobs to you. It's wow. going to cure regional inequality as well. Yeah. I mean, well, we shall see. Yeah, Look, live. good to see you both. <laughs> see you a little bit later on. Here's the weather.